All right, um, we are very pleased to have David Fawi here today. For those of you who don't know, <clears throat> David got his PhD from CMU, so he's coming back home after seven years? Yeah. Okay, so, yes. But did you come ever in between? I think so, one, one, time. one time. Okay, yeah. So he did his uh, PhD. Of course, he was my first PhD student also. So it's very, uh, like I was just remembering all those days where we used to sit in the offices and the Lord of the Rings uh, poster David found is still there. That has been there forever <laughs> as well. And um, yeah, so he's coming back home after seven years and now he has been doing a lot of great work in, uh, he's an assistant <coughs> professor in Michigan and doing a lot of great work in 3D and hands. And I think that's what he's going to be talking about today. All right, so take it away. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's, it's really wonderful to be back. Um, so we make sure this all works. All right, great. So, um, so I like to begin all my talks with a picture of a place you have never been to. So here is this nice, uh, beautiful hotel. And actually, I don't mind. I'm gonna just move this. So this thing. Ah, there we go. Much better. All right. So, so this is a place you've never been to, and you probably will never go to this. And I've never been here as well. And so I'd like you to each imagine what you would do in this scene. There are lots of different opportunities. So let's take like five seconds. And just so that we're all on the same page, let's pick a particular action and let's do, how would I go onto the balcony and close the door behind myself? And so you can imagine what you would do to go and go onto the balcony, it looks very nice outside, and to close the door. And you, you, know, you walk out onto the balcony and then you close the door. And this is quite simple. So this is something that you can do, a child can do. This is a very, very basic level of understanding. And the reason why I love this type of example is because You've never been here, you will never go here, and you're reasoning about actions that have never taken place and will never take place. You have this such a deep level of an understanding of the physical world that you can think about actions that have basically not even occurred. And this is the type of thing where basically everyone in the room would agree that you can just walk onto the balcony and close the door, and they understand this very easily. And this is something that you're able to get from a single picture. And so I've been very interested in this line of work of how do you develop this level of understanding of the world. And you can imagine there are lots of other things you can do. You can pick up this pillow. You can go walk into the, you know, the bedroom behind over there. And you have this level of, this, of scene understanding that enables you to reason about a world. And you can recover this from an image. And so one of the goals of my research, and basically the goal that I've been working on for the, ever since I started as a grad student with Abhinav many years ago, was I've been trying to get computers to have a sort of human or better understanding of the physical world from image data. So I'd like to have computers just have this level of effortlessness in terms of understanding the physical world. And I've really focused in the sort of past four years as a professor, I focused on really sort of three main directions. And the directions have been, first of all, understanding 3D. And so if I go off to the balcony and I just take this path around the chairs and behind the tables, you know that you can walk there, but one thing you should notice is that you actually can't see the floor for much of that path. And your understanding of the scene includes an understanding that goes well beyond the visible surfaces, but lets you reason about the stuff that you actually couldn't even see if you had, for example, a LiDAR. And so I've been very interested in understanding 3D and in pushing the, the limits of our sensors. And today I'm going to be talking about one of the directions, which is, under, which is reconstructing the full scene including invisible surfaces. And this is joint work with my student, Nilesh, as well as my student, Linye. I'm also broadly interested in understanding multiple images with very limited view overlap. So if I showed you another image of this hotel bedroom, you'd have a very good understanding. And what's exciting about this is this is something that humans are very good at, as evidenced by the fact that we look for apartments this way and we look for hotels this way. And yet, all the standard tools that we use in computer vision are basically broken for this. And so when I've tackled these problems, I've primarily focused on trying to take what we know about the 3D world and the sort of physical constraints we have. And the, the question for me has been trying to integrate our knowledge of the problem with how we actually use machine learning for this. And so I'm going to sort of illustrate this today, especially with talking about how do we construct the full world, including the invisible surfaces. And so this is something that, as a roboticist, you know, I, I spent five years here working with, and many of my friends worked on real robots. I'm very excited about the possibility that some of these techniques will, in the near term, actually be complementary to LIDARs. And this is exciting that we're finally at this point. But this sort of world of understanding the physical world from images has applications well beyond robotics. So robotics is one of the most obvious things I've really talked about over the past decade or so in terms of where can understanding the physical world be applied. One of the areas I've also been focused on, which I'll talk about today, is understanding 
um, uh, images and measuring things for science. And so one area I've focused on has been estimating the <coughs> vector magnetic field of the sun's photosphere, so estimating vectors. And this is actually very closely related to the very first problem I worked on at CMU, which was estimating surface normals from images. And here's actually the uh, a, a vector component of the sun's uh, magnetic field. And we're estimating this from images. And this is kind of exciting because techniques that we developed in the indoor world of 3D can actually be applied for uh, basic sciences. Another thing I've been working on has been measuring bird specimens at scale and taking the idea of measurement and applying it to help other fields. And so actually, in collaboration with C, who's here, um, who is working with me um, as an undergrad at Michigan, we've been developing techniques that let you scale up um, uh, measurement techniques for biology and have let people tackle very exciting new challenges. So in addition to that detour, the other thing I'm probably most well known for is trying to understand interaction. And if you look at this image, the if, even if I can reconstruct the scene in 3D, that's not necessarily the most interesting thing. What's interesting about the scene is what it can do in it. This is not just a collection of sort of atoms floating in the world, it's a collection of things that can be manipulated and changed. And so I'd love to be able to develop an understanding that lets me reason about how I would interact with this world. And so I've been, to, I've been uh, approaching this, and one of the things that's a key limiting factor has been understanding what humans actually are doing. And so I've been focusing on trying to develop systems that can understand human interactions. And so approach number one that I've taken has been learning hand interaction with large data sets. And so we've built a number of systems, uh, one of which I know many people inside uh, CMU have used, which is very exciting for understanding what hands are doing in the present. And the other direction I've taken, which doesn't use labeling, has been trying to learn about hand interaction by watching video. And so instead of actually labeling everything, what we're hoping to do is watch large amounts of video. And so this is the other direction I've been taking. But together, my hope is that we can understand what humans are doing so that we can then, in the future, predict what they could do. And hopefully then, this will enable autonomous agents, like robots, to then understand how to interact with the world. Because it's a lot easier to do something like reinforcement learning if you know roughly where to grab things, if you know the general idea of how you would interact with something. So these are the three main directions that I'm going to talk about. Um, and um, this is, I want to say, this is all joint work with my many students, um, uh, both sort of at the PhD level as well as the undergraduate and master's level. So let me just jump into 3D. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to work, I'd like to sort of explain a system that can take an image like this and produce a 3D understanding. And before I show you what our system produces, there are a couple things I want you to notice. One of which is that the floor continues behind the counter. So like you can see that this wooden floor goes behind the counter. And the other thing is that the cabinets themselves also continue. So you have this understanding of the space, and it's not just the visible surfaces, it's the invisible surfaces as well. And you can even imagine that the back side of this counter has also, there's a vertical surface there. There's another set of cabinets. And so this is joint work with my students, Nilesh and Linyu. And here is the output from our system. And so it's going to take a second. And so here it is. I'm going to let it rotate. And so it's going to be a little bit choppy because it's over Zoom. But here we go. And so you can see that it's able to produce a reconstruction of the 3D scene from the single <coughs> image. And you can imagine that a system like this is complementary to LiDAR-based sensors and other sorts of physical sensors. Because essentially, you can see parts of the scene that you and I both know are present, but which you actually physically can't see. And so you can infer it very nicely. And so I'd like to be able to produce this type of reconstruction. And so our goal is going to be to try to reconstruct the scene, including the invisible surfaces. And at test time, we're going to have a single previously unseen RGB image. Now, of course, these days in computer vision, it's important to mention whether you've seen the image during training time or not. And here we have it. We haven't seen uh, any data from the house where we're testing. And at training time, what I'd like to be able to use is ordinary images plus either meshes that were scanned, so they were scanned by a human, or they were scanned by a robot, but they're not artist-created, watertight meshes that are perfect. These are actual scans. Or the other thing I'd like to be able to use is posed RGBD. So RGBD, so depth maps, where I know the relative pose between them. And the method we're going to try to use is implicit functions, which is the, the technique that people have been primarily using to scale up reconstruction. And so let me show what the method does. And the idea here, again, is you should remember we're trying to produce a reconstruction from an image. And the way that implicit functions work, if you haven't seen them before, is that you're going to have a predefined grid of points that you're going to estimate some sort of distance at. So I'm going to have some sort of point x, which is going to be in 3D. And 
this is going to be, our goal is to estimate the distance to the scene at every single one of these points x. And this is a standard technique, which has enabled systems to really work quite well on very complicated data. And what we're going to do is, we're not going to just try to produce any arbitrary 3D reconstruction. We need to condition it on the image. And the way that we do this is that we're going to um, project the image, uh, the point in 3D, onto the image plane. And the actual location isn't so important, but it's basically the, the image content at that location which is important. So I can take a deep network, I can extract a feature from it, and this will provide me with information about the content of the image that's right there. And given this feature from the deep network, we can then pass this into um, some sort of multi-layer perceptron that will then here, for example, predict the distance to the scene at that location. And so this is basically, you have an image condition estimate of every single point in 3D, how far it is away from any single of these surfaces. And this is a very standard type of approach, and we originally wanted to use this, and we said, oh, this will be a very easy project. We'll just use this approach, we'll produce 3D reconstructions, this will all be very nice. And it turns out to have been very quite challenging. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sort of explain to you um, the challenges of trying to use this and trying to get this to work on real data, and two tricks that you can use, especially if you're using implicit functions that enable things to work much better. So what happens is you try to predict this, and what you get is you get a prediction of a grid of the unsigned distance function to this, for example, the nearest surface in 3D. So here is the <coughs> ordinary distance of how far am I from a surface. And so here um, you have basically, this is like the minimum um, of, all the, of all the points on the, on the surface. And the thing that's very important, and that kind of gets overlooked in all sorts of implicit function work, is that you actually need some sort of decoding function to convert the distances into a surface. So if I say, hey Toyota, I want to have this running a robot, I can give you a prediction of how far every single point is in 3D to a surface. Why don't you plug this in to your downstream systems? They say, okay, that's great, David, but what, we need surfaces. We want an actual point cloud. We want an actual mesh. And so you actually need something that will take this distance and then convert it into actual surfaces. And so, for example, some things you can do is you can say, okay, everything that's within a threshold epsilon, that's a surface. Everything that's not within a threshold epsilon, that's not a surface. That's, that's fine. You just take like, what's called a sub-level set. So you take the values, you threshold things, and this, this sh should work. Now, in practice, if you've played with um, anything in computer vision, as soon as someone says, oh, you just threshold it, you know that you're going to have a lot of trouble. Like thresholding, it doesn't necessarily work very well. Now, the reason why people typically don't encounter this when they work with sort of more um, uh, pure and nice and artist-created assets is that you typically get to predict what's called a sine distance function. And so in a sine distance function, the distance is positive on the outside of objects and it's negative inside the objects. And what happens is that there are lots and lots of very well-defined, nice approaches for taking a sine distance function and creating a, a surface. And there are things like margin cubes, you can find zero crossings, this is all very nice. And this is in fact where the graphics community develop things like sine distance functions, because it's very easy to extract surfaces out of it. Now the big challenge ends up being that, actually if I have a consumer scan from like, for example, an iPhone, or for example, if I get like a Matterport scanner, what happens is you, know, you don't actually get meshes which have well-defined insides or outsides. Instead what you get is you get basically just surfaces floating around in 3D. So if I just take out my iPhone and I scan things around, unless I'm extremely careful, like very, 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 very careful. I'm not gonna get something with a well-defined inside and outside. And you might look at this and you say, oh, come on, David, this is ridiculous. I see the bed. The bed has an inside, the bed has an outside. What's so hard about this? The important thing to remember is that this, is, this inside and outside is something that your brain sees and it's not something which is geometrically defined. And the problem is if it's not watertight, there's not an inside and there's not an outside, so you can't actually use any sort of sign distance functions. So, we're forced to use an unsigned distance function, and we sort of say, okay, let's try to train this. One of the big challenges is that we found that if you actually train the standard recipe that people use for stuff like pixel nerf, this just doesn't work. And the two, there are two reasons why, and I'm gonna show you these two things and how to overcome them. And hopefully this is useful if you do anything involving implicit functions. So what happens is, I'm trying to estimate for every single point in 3D, some sort of distance to a surface. And so I say, okay, is this thing close to a surface in 3D in this world? And so I have this point, this red point, it's floating out in space. Yeah? I have a question on the previous slide. Yeah. So if you use Apple uh, iPhone 14 Pro Max model, uh, <laughs> then uh, like, you're saying that you cannot uh, like, water type them by simple nearest neighbor interpolation, and the holes are bigger than that. 
Well, you can you can make them water type, but it's not necessarily the water type that you want. You're not going to necessarily get if I scan the if I scan, for example, the my part of the podium, I can water type this surface so that I can get it, this be water type, but it won't automatically fill in the backside of this podium. So it'll never get the full yeah. You'll never get the backside, and you'll never, for example, your houses, they might be technically water type, but they won't necessarily complete in a way that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, so, okay, you're trying to estimate this, this point in 3D. Um, and so what happens is that this point in 3D is actually not uh, just a point, but it's going to be uh, it's going to be a ray in space. And so this, you know, there's a camera, and you look at this point in 3D, and it goes out to the oven. You say, okay, fine, I have to estimate the location, the distance for all of the scene, for all the points along this ray. And you say, this is, this is pretty easy. You know, it just the ray connects with the oven. I just look at the oven. The oven's very easy. Great, very easy. What happens is if you look in and you zoom on a point of this ray, you can look at, what is the nearest part of the scene? And the nearest part of the scene is going to define what the distance is to the scene. So for example, over here next to this counter, the nearest part of the scene is also on this counter. And this is relatively easy. The counter is kind of close to the oven, so your network has to have some sort of finite receptive field. It has to look a little bit. But what happens is if I look at the entire scene, if I look over the entire ray, so for all the points that I have to make a prediction at, this covers all sorts of parts of the scene. It covers the counter in the front, it covers the oven, it covers the second counter. And if I project this back into 2D, what happens is that this, if I estimate the scene distance, I have to force every single pixel's feature to reason about large parts of the image. And this is not just some example that I cooked up to show in a talk. If you actually calculate how big the receptive field the network has to be, it has to be something like a third of the image, in order to, in, sort of on average. And so your network has to look at very, very large parts of the image and do a lot of complicated reasoning in order to estimate the near, sort of the distance to this nearest surface in 3D. And so our solution is you can basically forget about the entire scene and you focus only on the intersections between the scene and the ray. And one of the things that's useful about, about projective geometry is that if I say, okay, I'm not worrying about the entire scene, I just focus on the intersection of the ray and the scene, that point, all the intersections, by definition, have to project to the same pixel, because this is the pixel that goes out from that ray. into uh, the, This is the ray that goes through that pixel into 3D. And so by definition, everything has to project to the same pixel. And so your network doesn't have to work as hard. And so this is what's called, we call it a ray distance. If you do graphics, it's also known as a projected distance function. And if there's one thing you take from this bit of the talk, and you're doing stuff involving 3D, is that working with projected distances and predicting them substantially improves performance. And this is something that we find consistently in all of our models. So it doesn't solve all of our problems. So if I take another ray and it goes through the counter, let me just look at this uh, in bird's eye view. So here we have the, the ray going through the counter. And just for the sake of argument, let's say that it, the yellow dot is at three meters and the red dot is at four meters. What I'm trying to do if I have a projected distance is I'm trying to predict the distance at every single point along this ray. And the idea here is that if the distance is small, this is probably where a surface is. And this is, in some sense, by doing a projected distance function, you reduce things to a 1D problem, which is a lot easier. And so what people would love to use in uh, the computer vision community is you'd love to use a sine distance function, where basically it's negative on the inside, positive on the outside. And this makes things quite nice, but again, we can't get necessarily a water type mesh, or at least an accurate water type mesh. So we have to use an unsigned distance function. And what an unsigned distance function for this looks like is this w. Basically, it goes down to the intersection, and at the intersection, it's zero, because this is a distance function. The distance to the intersection at the intersection is, by definition, zero. This is very obvious. And it goes up, and then it goes back down again. And so this is what the distance function should look like. And we tried to train a model to do this, and the model basically refused. The model did very, very poorly, and we got the model doing quite poorly. And we tried to figure out why is it doing this. What happens with deep network training is sometimes you can train the model and you can be expecting it to work very nicely. And for some reason, it just refuses to work. And what's important, what I've found for the geometric problems, is you have to ask, what are you actually asking it to do? And so let's look at this. The reason is, if I have a single image, and I'm doing a single image 3D problem, typically we don't necessarily know exactly where the surfaces are. Maybe I think it's three meters, but it's really a distribution over the potential locations. And I can think about this as like, over the distance, over the sort of, uh, if I zoom in on one intersection, there's a distribution. Maybe it's at three meters, maybe it's somewhere else. And condition on where the intersection is, I get a different distance function. So here, if the intersection is in fact at three meters, it looks like this W. 
if it's at 3.1 meters, what will happen is the distance function will shift over. And if, I, if it's actually at 2.85 meters, it will shift over to another thing. And what happens is that the network will have to optimize over the potential locations of the intersection. And the network, if it's trained with a mean squared error, will minimize, essentially, will produce the expected value. And so even if you have millions and millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of samples, the network will simply get a better and better estimate of the expected value. And so the network's behavior is sort of incentivized to produce the expected value. And this is true for the mean squared error. And we've also shown that it is basically true for also other um, similar regression loss functions. And the thing about these distance functions, you can actually compute what the expected value is. You can compute what should the network actually do if you train this network to optimality. And it turns out that there's a, you know, there's a, there's some math, we figured out what these are, and they have a sort of closed form solution. If the CDF is this thing, we're not gonna go over this. Instead, of what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you what they look like qualitatively. The expected distance function, essentially what the network should produce, looks like this. And it looks like this cursive W. It's curved. This doesn't at all look like a distance function. So why not? Well, first of all, if I look at the intersection where it should actually be zero, it's actually not zero. In fact, you can calculate it out to be approximately this like sigma over the square root, or sigma times the square root of uh, two over pi. Um, and the derivatives themselves aren't actually plus or minus one. So this is not a distance function anymore. And so in some sense, your network is incentivized to produce something that's totally wrong. And what happens is that if I change the um, location, of, if I change my certainty about the intersection location, the shape changes. And so actually if I want to do something like I want to threshold, I say, okay, fine, I have a hack. I, I threshold by factor epsilon or whatever. The amount that I have to threshold by depends on how certain I am. And so you have this really, really horrible thresholding problem. And the derivatives are all wrong, so you can't actually use other methods. And so actually finding the surface is very hard. And what we encountered was basically when we tried to train networks to do this, we'd have very blobby or weird surfaces where stuff basically um, everything would look wrong. Now, why don't people actually know about this? So why am I talking about this? Well, people typically use a sign distance function. And what happens is if the uncertainty changes about your location, the sign distance function's expectation is actually quite, it, it's sort of also messed up. But what happens is the places where it gets distorted are far away from the intersection. So if I'm actually trying to find a surface, I never ever see this. And it's only if I'm trying to find, for example, the sign distance function in the middle, if I'm trying to estimate that, do I see issues. And I've actually talked to people who do things like find medial axes, and they run into this problem. And this, is sort of, this also causes them issues. So what's the solution? Well, we'd like to have something which works. And the solution that we've done is we've given up on predicting distance functions. So instead of producing distance functions, what we're going to do is we're going to produce distance-like functions. They're not quite distance functions. And I know if I say it's a distance function, the geometry people will come and get me. Um, and they'll say it's not this. So it's not a distance function. It's a distance-like function. So what you do is you find the direction to the nearest intersection. So you carve up the space. Are you before the nearest intersection or are you afterwards? <coughs> so the red one is before, the blue one is afterwards. And you make the distance positive or negative depending on where you are in the space. So in the red part, we make it positive. In the blue part, we make it negative. And then you say, okay, fine. We're not going to have a distance function. We're just going to cut it. We can sort of cut this over and flip it over and we get something which looks like this. Essentially, it's positive before, negative after. And this is a very, very minor change, but it's motivated by what we're actually asking the network to do. And it's positive and negative like the sign distance function, but there's no inside or outside. The inside and outside, the sort of the positive and negative components, is defined by the camera's location as opposed to something about the scene. So if you have a non-water type mesh, if you have something which is poorly behaved, this, you, don't, you don't need the inside and outside to define things. And what happens is that if I'm uncertain, I can look at the expected distance function, and what will happen is that it will be distorted, but the distortion is in between the intersections. There's no distortion at the location of the intersection. There's some stuff in between, which is all, all screwed up. But we don't care about this because we're not trying to find the surfaces. So we can modify what we predict in order to produce better surfaces. And this is sort of what we are going to do. We're going to have this directed ray distance function. And so we need some way of producing supervision for this. And so we need some sort of loss. So if I make a prediction at a point, we need some way of supervising that. And we've tried a number of different things. So if I have a point x in 3D, one option is we get a mesh. And this can be a non-water type mesh. And we calculate what the directed ray distance function is using the mesh. And we just train a regression network. And you don't need any, any extra tricks. You don't need any special uh, hand-holding for the network. This works extremely well. 
no extra sorts of like regularization on what the outputs look like. You can train this directly to do regression and it works beautifully. The other thing we've been able to do is you can actually take posed RGBD images. And the idea here is if I see this point X in another view, this might provide constraints about what the distance function could be. And the idea is that we're gonna take um, what we call an auxiliary um, image, and we have the RGB and we have the depth. And what I can do is if I zoom in on X, this point in 3D, I can look at parts of the scene that I can see are free space in another view. And this tells me a lot of information about what the distance function can be. And what we do is we have a uh, loss recipe which basically looks like some parts of the scene we can see are free space because we can see them from another view. We know that the distance at the location x in 3D, we know that its distance is that this tells us about the dis where the nearest intersection is. And so what we can do is we can say, okay, if some parts of the space can't have an intersection and some parts can't actually have a surface, we can say some distance functions are basically impossible. And we can use, do this due to the fact that we're doing this along a single one-dimensional subspace. And so we can train networks using this. And so what you can do is now we can train using, for example, robot data, where you have a robot that goes around, and so long as you can have OK odometry, and you don't need to have a globally consistent view, you can actually get posed RGBD images, and you can learn to predict single image, full 3D, including the invisible surfaces. And so in conclusion, essentially what the recipe for producing the 3D that I showed you at the very beginning looks like, you predict this directed ray distance function at every single x in a predefined grid. And you can find positive to negative zero crossings along the way. And you don't need extra tricks, you don't need extra regularization, you don't need a lot of extra stuff. This works very simply out of the box. And it's been a technique that other people have applied and I'd love for people to try this. And just, it's a very easy trick that will make your networks essentially produce much better 3D. So let me show you some results of the system in action. So this is on Matterport. And so the first hit is colored using normal colors and the second hit is colored using surface normal. So different colors indicate different directions. And this is a reconstruction of a scene we've never seen before. And you can see it's a little bit creative when it gets to further away hits, but this is because you are often trying to predict into the next room. And so the network is trying its best to predict, for example, what's in that room over there? And I went to CMU, so I know what's there, but if I'm a deep network, I don't necessarily know. Here's my favorite, which is where you have a kitchen. And so here's a reconstruction from a single image, and you're able to get the backside of this kitchen island. And it's able to recognize that because you can see essentially where the island ends. And this is, again, this is from a place it's never been to. This is not fine-tuning on the, the, the scene. And so just to show you for comparison, I'm going to show you on the top is the image, the right is the ground truth, bottom right is our method, DRDF, and bottom left is the unsigned distance function, the sort of standard recipe people have used. And let me just rotate this out. And what you're going to see is that essentially you can see that the bottom left, the unsigned distance function, is basically a mess. And here, it's going to finish on this, and you can see that the unsigned distance function is basically totally junk. And so, basically by doing two very small things, keeping the network identical, just simply doing a projected distance, so doing it all on 1D, and second thing, um, predicting our directed ray distance function, you can produce much, much cleaner outputs. And there's no extra architectural tweaking, there's no extra stuff, this is deliberately extremely simple and it works quite effectively. Quantitatively, um, we, oh yeah? So, uh, uh, what you're trying to do is basically given a point ID predict the distance, multi distance to the surface. Yeah. And what this will also do is that they sample. So you are trying to directly compute the integral and this will also sampling and doing it. Mm -hmm. It seems like providing more consistency in these results because you are checking all those points. Well, this is up, but if this is not up, but the next point on the is up, right? So, what makes it work better than Yeah, so we haven't directly compared with PixelNerf in this particular paper, we've compared in other papers. The, what I think works here is that you have the, um, the distance here is a very powerful signal because what you're doing is, in a PixelNerf thing, you're predicting this occupancy probability. And there are a lot of ways you can construct essentially the occupancy probability along the array. And in PixelNerf, you have to integrate them so that it produces the right color. Here, you have this very direct value so you have a very, it's a much more direct way of training things. And so you can essentially, if I sample a whole batch along the array, I have very direct supervision about every single point along that array, which forces things to train very nicely. Whereas with pixel nerf, you can do all sorts of, there's an entire sort of um, null space of things you can do along the array that basically doesn't change the pixel that you see, 
but which actually dramatically changes the interpretation of the 3D. So this trains very directly, whereas pixel nerf is a little more indirect. There, so yeah, so the question was basically, is there, is there some consistency between the points or do we enforce anything? And the beautiful thing is actually we don't need to. And we have we found that we don't need to add any sort of consistency. What we do find useful is if you batch everything so you have multiple points from along the array. But essentially what, I'm, what I suspect is happening is that because you have this regression loss, it's, um, it's not, uh, it's forecasting to work uh, quite a bit better because it's just, you have this very nice direct supervision. Um, but we don't ever actually need like a, a sort of like a, a conal loss to, for example, make the gradients one, which 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 you do need for all sorts of other stuff. Um, so, in terms of metrics, um, we use the standard metrics for 3D reconstruction, but we also factor things into like the, the full points, everything in the scene, and the hidden points. And so, one of the classic recipes for producing 3D would be you have what are called layer depth maps, um, and so you have a set of layers, you predict them, and when, what I, what I can't explain here in, in a talk like this is how much we spent trying to optimize the baselines. And they'll actually spend a ton of time doing this. Um, and with all the optimization, we get, a, you know, we get around under 20% F1 score for hidden surfaces. Trying to use the scene unsigned distance function, so implicit functions should work better, but they don't actually. Uh, and does quite a bit worse than a layered depth map. Using switching things to array recovers a substantial amount of uh, points. And finally, using our uh, direct array distance function improves things by considerable margin. So basically, around um, uh, seven, seven percentage points. And we have a version which uses RGBD only, and which actually performs about as well as our mesh-based DRDF, which is pretty exciting. And so the RGBD approach that we are able to develop actually will outperform systems that actually use a full mesh, which is exciting because you can gather post RGBD a lot easier. So this is something about a single image, but more broadly speaking, I'm very interested in trying to do new challenging problems in 3D. And one of the things I focused on has been taking two images with an unknown relationship, such as, for example, these might be hotel listings, and producing a 3D reconstruction. And so here's an output from one of our systems. And one of the things that's exciting about this is this is something that humans seem to be very good at because entire industries are based on this. And yet, Actually, for computer vision, a lot of our tools don't necessarily work with this. If you have wide baseline stereo, we don't know the relevant pose, a lot of the tools for computer vision are basically broken in this area. And so we've been developing techniques that provide a single coherent reconstruction, which has been pretty exciting. And more broadly speaking, we've been, I've been trying to develop systems that, in principle, can integrate with robotic systems in the coming years. And so I'd love to be able to take our systems that can produce 3D that's beyond the line of sight and integrate them with hardware-based sensors, for example, LiDARs. And so I think right now, 3D computer vision is at a point where it can actually contribute and help with um, the hardware-based systems as well. And they provide an orthogonal set of information in the scene. But in general, I've been very interested in trying to figure out what, who can benefit from computer vision. And one of the big things that people have, of course, said is that you know, there are things like healthcare. And so healthcare is something I've also worked on. And so computer vision can certainly help, help healthcare. And so I've been working with one of my students, Sarah Jabour, who's developed systems for understanding how um, uh, basically doing diagnoses of, from chest x-rays and understanding how computer vision models take shortcuts when they're trained on things. So looking for people's collarbones to guess their age as opposed to trying to diagnose pneumonia. But one of the things I'm, I'm excited about is I think computer vision has a lot of uh, potential to influence fields that you really haven't thought about. And so for example, solar physics and evolutionary ecology are two things I've worked on that I've found to be extremely exciting and to be really ripe for a lot of uh, work with computer vision. And so I wanted to talk briefly about my adventures there. And so why do people study solar physics? Well, first of all, it's, it's intrinsically a little bit interesting. The other thing is that extreme people, space weather. Uh, yeah. People would they have, I mean, um, so in the previous stuff, like the DRDF based training, can you actually do it with uh, single RGB images as well? Take train with lots of RGB images or no? That's something like that. Because it seems right now you need meshes or you, you do need um, separate data to, from another, another view, but one of the things we found is that if you train it with RGBD data, one thing you do is you pre-train a depth network that learns a lot about how the world works. And so you pre-train on single RGBD images with a small amount of views from a different angle, you can, you can fine tune and things get quite a bit better. So the, um, you train with, uh, you can imagine you have a small amount of 
multi-view data, and a very, very large amount of um, single-view data. Thank you. Also, I mean, what data does it was trained on and the results? So it's, it's uh, Matterport um, 3D. How um, much data is this? It's something on the order of 10,000 images. Images, okay. Yeah, we've trained it for upwards of like, I think 50,000 is for Omni data, but I, I, I'm not confident about the number. Is there a way, I mean, like, I think uh, I'm asking like the Shivam's question probably again. Is there a way to know like printing occupancy versus printing distance, which one is going to generalize better? Yeah, uh, occupancy, so we've tried occupancy. So you can get occupancy networks to do pretty well. Um, what happens is they kind of come up a little bit short. So we compared against the occupancy stuff where you essentially, you can't do the full correct occupancy where you have the occupancy inside, for example, the podium. You can do occupancy as in there is a surface within epsilon at this point. And that works pretty well, but it's a little bit less accurate. And it's because essentially what happens is this, this, uh, the surfaces get dilated a little bit. And so you get less accurate stuff because the, um, you can think about the uh, occupancy as like a very, like a binarized version of the distance. And so you get your, your surfaces that look basically a little bit worse. And we don't have it in here, but essentially it's somewhere between the unsigned ray distance function and the um, DRDF. I mean, so, I mean, are you arguing that uh, everyone should use DRDF rather than like so? Nerf should change. Uh, no. So, so Nerf is Nerf is going to be a Nerf works very well for doing a rendering type stuff. So, rendering. If you want to render things, you shouldn't use DRDF. But if you want to produce, for example, three D, and we don't have it in this particular. I don't think you can also. Because okay, you need the you need to do the the rendering equation. But essentially, the but for producing three D, we've we've actually compared it with like Pixel Nerf, for example, and you replace it with Pixel Nerf, and the numbers are. Uh, quite a bit worse, like even worse than any of these. Essentially, they're bad enough that you know we don't we don't even show them. Essentially, uh, because essentially the the pixel nerf objective is not going to necessarily try to optimize for um, it's not going to optimize for uh, reconstruction quality. It's going to optimize for visual quality when you reproject, which is not going to get you good 3D. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so we, we've, uh, that's one thing that we're very interested in for the future, where you can imagine if you have multi-view RGB, you should be able to get some estimate of 3D, and you should be able to do something like, imagine if I had multi-view RGB like from historical places, you should be able to actually do the RGBD, post-RGB thing actually, and have it work. Um, so that, that would actually work, but we haven't tried that yet. Okay. Can um, you can you not create a rendering version of it? I'm just trying to. Uh, I mean, you, I mean, I think what I understood, maybe I understood it wrong. But you said that you you cannot use it like Nerf style because you cannot render with it, right? Well, is that Nerf? Well, I mean, Nerf is going to be a lot much less useful signal because you rend you render to to the image, and there are lots of ways that you can actually then, like we're, we're training with a very small number of views, so you're rendering to the image, and you're. Um, that doesn't provide a very powerful constraint. That provides a very limited constraint, because lots of points along the array would work. You can, you can set the depth to anything you want along the array. Like if you have tons and tons and tons of views and you want to fit to a single scene, it, it works really well. Um, but if you have like pixel nerf, like you want to get pixel nerf to scale up to, for example, stuff the size of like this room, it doesn't work quite as well. Um, especially if you have like realistic data. I mean, ideally, we'd love to move towards RGB only, but then the, the catch is then you have, need to you're, you need to have either extremely large amounts of data, or you need to have a couple of other tricks. And we don't I don't think we have these tricks yet. I mean, to me, those are orthogonal auto, auto questions, and that's why I was trying to push you towards that because I mean, I think the question is occupancy versus DRDF. I think that's what I'm trying to debate in my mind. I mean, is this is there something fundamental here with or not? On that axis, uh, and I, I think the only way to know it is by comparing somehow. We, we, we have a comparison with the occupancy stuff, and it, it works worse, essentially. Um, and if it works worse, then someone has to change to this. Then I don't know how. I mean, I, I'm probably saying it at very high level, but if you are, if you believe occupancy is not the ideal thing to represent 3D, then everyone should use this. So, but I think for occupancy, essentially, what you can get is you can get sort of soft. You can use occupancy as a way of 
I understand then the soft, and then you can render it. I mean, so I've asked you, but you can, can you convert this into somehow rendering machine? But you, but you, I mean, you can imagine you add this plus an occupancy thing. I, just, I think that the occupancy, the, the fact that you, occupancy is this soft thing, the network essentially can use the, the, the model, the rendering equation to essentially, um, uh, essentially to cheat a little bit. So you can have stuff that is not necessarily physically plausible, but produces better images in terms of better PSNR. Um, okay, so what are the other, um, let's see, what, does anyone have any guess about what the other national level threat is? Uh, like there's one other thing which might, something can shut down a nation. Asteroid. Asteroid, that's a, that's a good one. It's, it's a little bit more down to earth. It's something we've all seen recently. Solar flare? Uh, so solar flare would be one of these examples. It's something that may have shut things down for a little bit recently. It's actually pandemic. And so the, in terms of like the, the sort of damage to like the economies, extreme solar weather is considered to be basically on par with the, the pandemic. And so what people do is they monitor the sun's magnetic field because essentially the magnetic field is what produces um, the solar, uh, extreme solar weather. And they also produce, for example, the, the angle of that magnetic field because you need to understand the configuration in order to estimate properties. And so basically the estimates of the, uh, the magnetic field are used to basically a foundation for a lot of the space weather pipeline. And so things for like boundary conditions, so you have a large differential equation model, or you use this for uh, generating features. And the way that people get this is you basically are going to, you have um, light that comes from the sun, and you disentangle the, what's called the Zeeman effect from other factors. And what happens in the Zeeman effect is you have light, and this is like spectral line from an ion, and when you have a magnetic field, so the magnetic field goes up to 3,000 Gauss, the line splits into multiple lines. And so if you can measure light in different wavelengths, you can basically see how strong a magnetic field is. And so you happen to know certain types of spectral lines happen on the sun. And you can say, okay, we're gonna measure the, the, the magnetic field this way. The thing that makes this complicated is the sun actually moves, and what happens as it moves, it shifts over the magnetic field, the, the, the spectral lines. So lines get shifted over, and so you actually have to, um, uh, you actually have to sort of account for this as well. And there's lots and lots of other details. There's like stuff like polarization, there are things like, uh, the calibration that get involved, and this is very, very painful. But what happens is people build these instruments and they put them up in the, uh, the sky and you have estimates of the, what's called the Stokes vector, so the polarization of the light. And they produce magnetograms by a process where you invert the physical model. So you have a physical model of how magnetic fields transform light. And you solve for the best physical explanation that explains the light you can see. And so this is the problem is that this is extremely slow. So you have to solve an optimization problem for every single 4096 by 4096 pixel. And what we did is we built systems that can do like a learning-based inversion, which is 100 times faster, and it's accurate, produces uncertainties. And um, there are lots of details in order to get this to work on solar physics data. There are lots of things that work in internet data that don't work here. But in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip that. But the, the interesting thing is that often there are a lot multiple instruments in the sky, and they often have different capabilities. So for example, one of them will have a full disk picture and will take pictures with essentially a global shutter and it does it very fast. But what happens is because it takes a full disk picture, it doesn't have very good sampling of the wavelengths. And so this leads to imperfect accuracy and lots and lots of artifacts. And when people try to use data from this model, what happens is the artifacts show up in people's simulations of the sun and the data is essentially unusable. And so people build other instruments that have different capabilities. So there's another instrument which produces better, denser measurements of the spectra. But essentially what happens is it's a rolling shutter. And so it slowly, 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 slowly takes pictures. And so as it takes pictures, the sun evolves. And so your, your measurements are actually not particularly good uh, in that sense of in terms of images. And so what we've been doing has been building best of both worlds instruments that combine these two instruments together. And so we use as input the full disk pictures from the much better, from the sort of much better in terms of spatial properties instrument. And we use as answers for our models the magnetic fields that come from the, uh, the higher quality, uh, small field of view instrument that sees a very small part of the sun. And we're able to estimate magnetic fields that essentially are incorporate best of, the best of these two instruments. And so the pros that we get is we get a system that can produce a full disk picture and it can produce data very, very fast. And because it's deep learning, the processing is very fast, something like 30 seconds. And we have very, very small amounts of artifacts compared to the original system. And the challenge ends up being that um, there's limited ground truth, so what happens is you have to have large, large long-term collaborations with the physicists to understand how you actually validate this, because you don't actually have a full good picture with high quality of the entire sun. So you have to look at other sorts of proxy quantities. And so here's the sun, and I'm, I'm going to show you some outputs from the system just to give you a sense. 
this thing over here is a sunspot, so if I looked at it in the visible light, this would essentially be dark. It's a dark and much cooler region of the sun, and it's an area where there's strong amounts of magnetic field. And here's an output from our system, and so this is, uh, the top left is the field strength, and the bottom, the other three in purple-orange, are the three vector components. And so what we're doing actually is we're estimating the vector field, so the orientation and the, and the, light, the size of the vector field. And what's happening is you have these, in many of these places, you have the very um, complex configurations. Here right now, there's actually a sunspot, so it's basically a, a sphere um, in terms of the vector configuration. And people track these and they use them to, in order to monitor, basically, is there going to be a flare in the next, say, 48 hours? And the system is able to process two months of data in something like a day, and actually rerunning the entire mission's pipe, uh, data, which sort of took 12 years of compute time for the mission to do, we could do this essentially for something like, we've, I've done the math, something like $50,000 on like AWS. And so you can do this extremely quickly. And so if you want to redo things, it's, it's you know, in comparison, essentially we can, we can do this much, much faster and much more cheaply. And the system essentially produces good enough data that excitingly people are actually trying to take our data and distribute it as a science data product for people to use. Essentially, because, the, because of using the better instrument for the answers, we fix a lot of artifacts, and so people now want to use this as, a, as basically data for doing science. Um, one of the things that's also exciting has been, in the process, we've done things like, for example, fix the calibration. And so using camera calibration uh, techniques, we actually have been able to fix cal calibration issues in one of the missions uh, telescopes, which has been kind of exciting, where it's been up there for over 12 years, and there's still a bug that's been floating around, and we were able to fix it. So, the other thing I've been, I've been interested in has been trying to measure things in uh, ecology. And so here, in, if you're a biology grad student, you often have to measure things. And this takes a very long time. So measuring all the this bird bones for this uh, uh, ruby crown tanager uh, would take a sort of technician 15 to 30 minutes. And so what people want to do is when they want to study how our birds respond to climate change, it takes a very long time. So people actually never get large scale data. So they're talking about hundreds or maybe a thousand samples. And so Z um, and Gimechu, uh, developed a system which basically we have a camera which is mounted and we have a very nicely built setup so we can actually measure, measure linear measurements like the length of a bone just by taking photos and doing something like mass scar CNN. <coughs> and we built a system where we can take pictures of these bird bones and they all kind of look the same to most people until you start really looking at them in detail. And what we can do is we can detect which ones they are and we can segment them very accurately. And by the fact that they're on a, on a, a flat essentially a thing, we can um, measure them very effectively. And so here's what essentially a trained lab tech could do in a day if they worked very, very fast. And this is under an hour for our system. And if you zoom out further, you can essentially get um, what a trained lab tech can do in two weeks, which would take something like an afternoon for our system. And so what's exciting is you can now actually look at large amounts of data very, very easily. Um, and you can, um, uh, this, will, this will enable our collaborators to test hypotheses about biology that people have classically thought but actually haven't been able to study. They have these hypotheses, but they test it on like hundreds or thousands of specimens. And we're able to scale, scale up to sort of tens of thousands and hopefully soon hundreds of thousands of specimens to let people actually study things. And it's been very exciting. This is just basically a tenth of the data that they're able to process. So it's been very exciting to be able to uh, do this sort of stuff. So I want to, in the last bit, just briefly talk a little bit about some of the work in terms of understanding interaction. And so I showed you this example of the refrigerator and the, the kitchen, and I talked about how we can reconstruct the world as it is. But I'm also excited about reconstructing the world as it could be. So if I look at this, the interesting thing about this is the things I can do. I can open these, I can pull these, I can, I can act on this world. And I've been very interested in this, again, since I started at CMU. And one of the things I've been interested in doing is learning about how the world works by observing people um, manipulating it. And so if you actually look at the uh, developmental psych literature, babies spend an enormous amount of time watching other people manipulate objects. And this is how babies are so good at manipulation. They spend something like, uh, there was a, I saw a paper recently that claimed that they spend something like 80% of their time when they're watching other people, they're watching them manipulate stuff. And there's like a built-in curriculum in development that enables them to understand how the world works. And we've been building systems that can understand articulation in 3D, and we can take the 3D we develop and bring it to internet videos. But the thing that's very important and that I've been sort of struggling with as a researcher in this area has been that the hands, to, the hands that people use to manipulate are key to how do they interact with stuff. And we typically have very bad models for understanding hands. And there are people who develop stuff in the lab that doesn't necessarily deploy onto real robot data or on internet videos because it's too hard. 
And so we've been developing systems that basically provide basic hand information that just works. And this is joint work for my student, Dan Dan, that was with Giaji, who is here, and uh, Michelle, who's at Cornell now. And we provide information like, for example, left versus right hand, which lets you reconstruct things, the box people are interacting with, and the association between the hands in the box. And so we've been taking this and scaling it up. We have systems like uh, 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 Visor, which is for the Epic Kitchens data set, where you have very high quality masks. And one approach we've been taking has been just simply scaling up annotation and providing better and better estimates of what hands are doing and how they're interacting with the world in segments. And so we try to scale things up by segmentation and by annotation. And this, in the immediate term, is a great solution. And I know it's been exciting that people here have been using our systems to provide essentially understanding of human demonstrations. And so that's one approach. But of course, we can't label everything in the world. What we'd love to be able to do is watch videos and watch people interact with things. And so if I watch people interact with the world and buy, build IKEA together and stir chicken and take knife and insert coffee holder and all sorts of other things, I should be able to learn how hands interact with the world. And so what we've been focusing on is what people are holding. And so the problem we're going to tackle is we have an image and we have a query point, and which we assume is on a hand. We want to get a segment of the hands and the handheld object. So here we put a query point on uh, Wertheimer's hand, and we get a, a segment of the hand and a segment of the object that the person is holding. And here we put it on his other hand, and we get the hand, and hopefully we get the segment. And so this is what we'd hope to get. And so we've been focusing on this with uh, two students, Richard Higgins and Dan Dan Shan, and we've been trying to use the idea where we bring information to these videos in order to understand them. So the videos by themselves are not enough, but if we understand where things are moving and we know which pixels are humans, we should be able to produce better uh, information. And so the two things we use are optical flow and masks of human pixels. And the idea is we produce features um, from images, and the features get supervised by optical flow, which provides common fate. And common fate is simply which that objects that move together have to group together. So a zebra's stripes look radically different, but because they move together, they have to go together. And human pixels simply provide hands, and we use a very basic off-the-shelf system that um, called Turnhouse Net, which some which uh, Kaggle Grandmaster uh, created. And we can use these together to provide some sort of loss function that organizes our feature space. And we do things like we try to train models to, for example, predict do two pixels go together. And we use very, very simple signals, for example, um, do pixels, um, are they basically both outliers for a fundamental matrix fit by Ransack, and they're all within some sort of connected component. So we use a very simple signal, and this by itself doesn't work most of the time. But over large amounts of videos, you extract good signal. The other thing we can do is if we know which pixels are humans, we can then understand um, this is a pixel which is moving, and this is a pixel which is a hand that's also moving. And so we can group these together and say, OK, this is a hand which is moving an object. And individually, any individual frame, this idea of a pseudo label is not going to necessarily work. But over large amounts of data, you can actually train reasonable models. Um, and so let me just show you so we can produce things like features, and we can do things like cluster them and produce clusters. Now, I'm not showing quantitative results in the interest of time, but we evaluated compared to all sorts of things that you would say, like, oh, why not RGB? Why not deep features? Why not this? And these systems, actually, if you train using this optical flow, common fate idea actually produce much better um, uh, signals, essentially. You can also take a hand pixel and take all the other pixels in the image. It can predict what goes with the hand. And so we can learn reasonable um, associations between hands and handheld objects. And the other thing, and finally, just in the interest of time, is going to get to this. We can also predict, you can use um, our system to take boxes that people have annotated. And you can just, having learned from video, you can produce better segmentations. And so the hope is you can actually convert boxes that people annotate, which is very cheap. And you can use video and learn by watching people interact with the objects to get the segments, as opposed to having people manually mark each and every frame in the video in order to learn things. And so you can train these. And these are outputs from a system which was trained only on boxes, as well as segments that were auto-generated. So with that, um, I'm just going to, in the interest of time, just skip to sort of the very end. So what I've talked, to, talked about today is going from RGB to full 3D. And the key was analyzing what we expected networks to do. I've also talked a little bit about visual measurement for science. And here, the this thing that I found to be successful is you have good computer vision, and you have good collaborators who will help you evaluate things. And finally, I've talked about going from RGB to hands and handheld objects. And here, we've been either labeling the right data, or we've been just simply applying the classic ideas of common data scale. And I'm the person who's talking about this today, but this is joint work with uh, a large number of students, and this has been a great pleasure to work with them. And so that, that is it for me. Uh, you can take a couple more questions. If
So in the common paper that you touched upon at the end, was there <coughs> learning specific to hands or it was just video specific learning that at inference you would spit out pixels associated with the hands? Yeah, so we've tried both. So um, what, what happens is you, you can get, if you just pretend, if you don't pretend, or if you pretend that people don't exist and you just don't assume that, you can get actually reasonably good um, training this way, which is very surprising to us, where you basically have a very, very silly grouping signal and you have a very, you just train over large amounts of data, and this suggests that optical flow has gotten substantially better over the years. But what you can't necessarily do, unless you have the people, what you can't do is you can't do the association. And the association is hopefully what we hope will let people do things like understand if I pick something up, what goes in my hand. So, but the method itself was, was very simple and it actually ended up working quite well, even on sort of um, data sets where people had very, very complicated sort of four page methods. Uh, with a lot of inspiration from psychology and just this very simple just train does it uh, is an outlier actually work quite well. Can you explain the last part again on the, on the last slide? Did you think that you don't generate every box, sorry, every object? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically what happens is you can get segments out of our system by just doing something like uh, DB scan. And you can actually, using the features, you can actually take a box and essentially you run something very, a process very similar to grab cut, and you can get much better, uh, you can get very good boundaries for objects, and you can actually convert boxes, and so you can annotate a bunch of boxes in the image, and automatically convert those boxes into segments. So you, the process of getting the annotations for a large segmentation data set, the main challenge is actually the segments, because that's where you have to spend the most money. But the boxes themselves provide a very powerful um, bit of information, and then just by watching people manipulate, you actually understand what objects actually exist in the data set. So this might not work on maybe Davis, but it works actually quite well in something like Epic Kitchens. The argument here is that you just label boxes, yep. free. Yeah, you get segments you for free. Like, uh, exactly. Yeah, so you so can... Do you need segments? So do, do we need segments? So segments are very useful for doing stuff like reconstruction. Like if you have, like if I'm manipulating an object, I want to know which pixels actually belong to the object or not. Yeah, yeah. So rolling shutter is it's a great trade off. You get you get some things out of it. But the problem with the rolling shutter, especially one that takes a very long time, is that you never get a coherent picture of something. So it'd be like taking a rolling shutter of uh, people walking, you have you never have actually you never capture everybody all at the same time. So what happens with satellite stuff, uh, in this particular case for the sun, you actually the sun actually moves and so it moves fast enough. I thought the sun was very slow and boring, but it actually moves fast enough so that as you take the photo, it's essentially like trying to take a photo of an Olympic sprinter, and you get a photo every, and you can take a photo every now and then, but you never get a photo of anyone actually in one particular pose. And so you actually can't use the data for a lot of stuff because this, you never have a single coherent photo. Yeah. Okay, I ask other questions then. Um, so this last part, I mean, like you started with this amazing story that, okay, you want to understand image, you want to open the door and uh, open the drawers and so on. And I thought, oh, we are going to get there. But this last part, this egocentric stuff, to me, I mean, I have been wondering a lot and I'm asking you from your experience, is egocentric data useful at all? Because you did not transfer it ever to the yeah. uh, first image that you were actually showing. Yeah. And you have been... Like I think six or seven years you've been playing with hundred days of hands. <laughs> uh, is it worth it for anything, or I mean, like, because nothing is transferred anywhere except in its own data set. Yeah, yeah. So oh, one, one certainly we do we do transfer from different hand data sets, and that does seem to work pretty well. The hand model, hand stuff does seem to transfer. But in terms of going to like, okay, I'm going to work on a third person data, the hand data, and detector will work. Oh, okay, going from ego. Okay, going from ego to the third person. Okay. Um, some things will work, some things won't. Like definitely left versus right doesn't work. Objects have a lot of trouble. Um, but with egocentric, the reason why egocentric is exciting, why I'm still interested in egocentric, why I've actually switched over, is I used to talk a lot about third person data. And I'd say, oh, we're gonna watch people open things and we're gonna understand how the world works. And I think it's very important to notice about when people open things. If I go and open the door, unless I'm a grad student trapped in someone's research experiment, I will never open the door like this. I will never let you see me open the door. If I actually interact with objects from a third-person view, I will always interact with the object like this, so you can never actually see the interaction. 
if you watch lots of YouTube videos of people doing stuff, it tends to show that. So I think egocentric, certainly there, there has been a, you know, there is still a while over a little ago to actually transfer this to other things, but I think third person is not gonna necessarily work. No, I think I mean the two things here. I mean, so I agree that egocentric is a good training source because you can see the yeah. things happening. But I mean, we are thinking of building an agent, like let's yeah. say a robot who sees other people do things. But I will still see it from third person because I'm a robot. I'm not stand, stand I'm not on you. Yeah. Uh, and so, my question is actually, I mean, I from perspective of uh, egocentric, like egocentric being a good trainer, I understand because you can see the objects in yeah. hand and so on much better. It's close to you anyhow, to, so it will be better. But again, if it doesn't transfer, what's the use? So I think that does, I think it will transfer. I think it's, um, but there's no, ex because, because no evidence because, of anything like that. Sure, I think we're, we're going to- see years, you, you should have done no, it. No, 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 <laughs> I, I've only switched, I've only started doing egocentric, I only started doing egocentric in 2020, so two years. So okay. I'll come back in two years. The days of hand is not egocentric. No, it has third person. Okay. It has some egocentric and some third person. So, but what we what we do have lined so up. Before you come next time, you should have it. We, we do have something which is very close, very close. It's All tantalizing right. for us. So. All right, so we have a promise. Oh great! All right, okay. Okay. On okay. Video, we'll end the talk. Let's thank David. Again.